One time, I went to the bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21, so I hadn't been to many bars up to that point. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already pretty drunk when we got there. When I sat at the bar, a cute girl came and started talking to me and my friend. She said her name was Candace, and I noticed she had really, really bright red hair. I assumed she dyed it. It was pretty, but unnatural. Anyways. The girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell my friend was already very drunk. To be honest, I played along like I was drunk already too, since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks, so I told her we didn't have much money. She offered to buy us drinks. She kept buying us drinks, and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. After some time, my friend went to the bathroom before he could come back, he was kicked out by the bouncers as he was too drunk. So Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her. He was so out of it that he could barely answer her. I told her he was too drunk and that I couldn't let him go anywhere. I didn't want him to. Wake up hungover in some random house with no car and no idea what happened. Candace kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him, but I told her no because I had to stay with him. I was more sober than him and he was my responsibility. I told her the only way he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed she thought that I was jealous or cock blocking but my friend could barely stand and lost interest in Candace already at that point. She immediately started flirting with me and offered to get my friend a taxi to drive him home and said we could go to her place alone. At this point I had a few drinks and I was pretty buzzed so I agreed. We took my friend to the taxi and then walked to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way to her car. Wow, you're pretty drunk, huh? She said, smiling as she held onto my arm. Yeah, I said. I don't know why, but I just felt slightly shy and anxious. Everything was just happening too easy for me, so I felt a bit uneasy. We got into her car and drove down the street. Wanna stop at the liquor store and get some more to drink? I'll buy it so don't worry about paying, she offered. I didn't want to drink any more than I already did. I was already buzzed and wanted to be able to carry myself throughout the rest of the night. Sometimes I make myself look stupid when I'm drunk, so I didn't want to ruin anything with Candace more than I already did earlier by telling her my friend was too drunk. I told her I was already drunk enough, but she insisted I didn't want to seem lame. So I told her to get me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. I assumed she wanted to drink more also, and that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. During the car ride, we passed the bottle back and forth, but she took tiny sips. I tried to take tiny sips, but she kept passing me the bottle and telling me to drink. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice and pretended to drink the bottle, but spitting the liquor in the apple juice bottle. A few minutes later, I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liquor out the window before she saw it. I didn't want her to know that I was acting drunker than I was. She actually believed I was sloppy drunk when I was simply buzzed. I took a couple more sips of liquor and finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride, I called her the wrong name a couple of times to get a reaction out of her. She didn't react to it. She just kept letting me call her Carla without correcting me. For some reason, I thought she lied to me about her name initially. We drove up to her house and I pretended to trip and stumble into her front door. She helped me walk inside by holding me up. She opened her front door, which was unlocked. We walked in her house, she closed her front door, and then locked it. I thought that was strange, but assumed she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I had to use the bathroom and walked into her bathroom, locked the door, and looked in the mirror. I just felt strange and felt like something was off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing the bottle earlier. I turned on the sink to make noise and then made myself puke up the liquor I drank. I flushed and went to the sink and started drinking the tap water out of my hands to sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk but I still wanted to hook up with Candace so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. When I turned the sink off I heard her talking to someone. He's drunk as hell. He can barely stand up. You do it. 
Who was she talking to? And do what? I walked out of the bathroom and into the living room. The moment I stepped into the living room, I saw her walking into another room. All I could see was the back of her head, that strange, very bright red hair go into another room. Couldn't see her face or anything, just saw her kind of walk fast into the room. The living room was pretty dark. Hey, where are you going? I slurred, like I was drunk. She walked back into the dark living room, and up to me, let's go in my room, she said. I looked at her bright red hair, and then into her eyes. They were different, and her face was different. It was another girl. Another girl with the same hair. That's when I realized. It was another girl with the same wig on. It was a wig the whole time. She had changed it, with the girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped, but I tried to look like I had no idea. It was a different girl. Kind of smiled at her and told her, just needed to use the bathroom one more time, and told her sorry I was so drunk. She said, it's fine, just hurry up in there. I stumbled back into the bathroom and locked the door. I heard her whisper something to someone again. This time I think I heard a male voice whisper back. Honestly, I didn't concentrate on listening to exactly what she said. Something sketchy was going on and I had to get out of that house. I opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and ran faster than I have ever ran in my life. I didn't look behind myself or anything, just ran through the backyard jumped the fence, ran through someone else's backyard, hit a road, and ran toward the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw a 24-hour convenience store. I ran into the store and stood straight at the front of the store in front of the camera. I called a taxi and went home. The next day after this incident, I went back to the house with a couple of friends to see just what was going on. Nobody was there. No cars, no people, Nothing. Just an empty house. I ended up finding out that the house was a summer rental, and whoever those people were, they broke into that house and used it for only that night and never came back. I try to think what happened that night. What was she, or they, planning that night? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe a robbery. But she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks and even paid for my friend's taxi. And mostly, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? What did it mean? And what was in that room they tried to lure me into? <laughs> this all happened when I was 19. I was never the most handsome guy and I always struggled with the ladies. That's why I eventually ended up on Tinder, but even on the app, I wasn't having much luck. That was until I received a message from a blonde woman named Della. To be honest, when I first saw her message, I thought she was just a bot because of her attractive profile picture. But then, three days later, she messaged me again, which was odd because bots usually don't follow up with more than one message. So I decided to take a closer look at her profile, and to my surprise, it was a real person. While her profile was pretty standard, it definitely wasn't the typical generic profile that you would expect from a bot. I was intrigued and I replied to her message. We had been chatting away for about a month, getting to know each other more and more with each passing day. Then one day, she proposed an idea that caught me by surprise. Why don't you come visit me? She said, a hint of excitement in her voice. At first, I was hesitant. She lived almost eight hours away by car, and the thought of making that long of a journey just to see someone I had only talked to online made me a bit uneasy. But the truth was, I really liked her. I had been considering asking her if I could come see her for a while now, so I couldn't say no. After some gentle prodding from her, I finally caved and agreed to make the trip. I mean, I had no reason to suspect anything was off about her. We had video chatted every other week, talked on the phone most days, and she always seemed so genuine. I figured I just got really lucky and found someone amazing to connect with. Of course, looking back now, I realized that I was naive and should have been more cautious. But at the time, 
I was just excited to finally be able to meet her in person. As I made my way over to Ella's place, things started to feel a bit off. She kept sending me texts asking where I was and making sure I was still coming. And when I took a little longer than usual to respond, she got a bit annoyed and sent a string of texts. I understood that she was probably just nervous about me visiting, and to be honest, I was feeling pretty nervous too. When I finally arrived at the house, I had a bit of a trouble finding it at first. The directions she gave me were a bit confusing and the roads were a mixture of gravel and dirt surrounded by a dense thicket of trees. But eventually, I came upon an old looking house with a boarded up window on the second floor. Despite its worn out appearance, the house didn't look abandoned and I could see Ella's red buggy, which she always talked about, parked in front of the garage. I sent her a text letting her know that I had arrived and she replied with just a smiley face emoji. As I approached the door to Ella's house, I noticed someone peeking out of one of the second floor windows. I couldn't make out who it was, but I figured it must be her dad, who she had mentioned visiting her every so often. I shrugged off the eerie feeling and went ahead to knock on the door. Ella greeted me with a warm smile and a surprising kiss on the cheek. I followed her inside and we settled on her couch, catching up on life and discussing our plans for the future but then I remembered the figure in the window and brought it up to Ella. So, you didn't mention that your dad was here. Was that going to be a surprise or something? I asked, trying to lighten the mood. <laughs> Ella's expression shifted to confusion. My dad isn't here, she told me. I was a little taken aback. Are you sure? Because I could have sworn I saw someone watching me from the upstairs window. Ella's face went pale and she urgently suggested that we leave. We have to get out of here, now. I didn't know what to make of it, but I could sense the fear in her voice, and I quickly followed her out of the house. Ella and I bolted out of the door and headed straight to our cars. As I was getting into my car, she told me that her dad wasn't there and that she'd been alone until I arrived. I immediately knew that something was wrong and I called the police to report a suspicious person. While I was on the phone giving the address to the 911 operator, Ella suddenly gasped and pointed to the window where we had seen the guy earlier. Sure enough, he was back, looking at us from outside the window. I got a better look at him this time, and I was taken aback by what I saw. He looked older, frail, and like he hadn't had a proper meal in a while. It was almost as if he was struggling to survive. The man quickly realized that we had seen him and he disappeared from the window. Ella and I were both relieved that he was gone, but we still felt uneasy. Ella was in tears and kept repeating how she felt like an idiot for not keeping the doors locked. I was trying my best to calm her down, but it was a stressful situation. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the police arrived. It took them about half an hour to get to us, and during that time, Ella continued to cry and mumble to herself. When the officers arrived, they started asking us questions and two of them went inside to search the house. They came back out a few minutes later and informed us that thankfully, the intruder was no longer there. However, they did find that the back door was hanging open and whoever had broken in had fled into the woods. One of the officers took my statement while the other continued to search the area, just in case the intruder was still nearby. After a few more minutes of searching, the officer confirmed that the intruder was gone. They gave us some advice on how to make the house more secure, and once they were sure that everything was under control, they left. Ella asked me to spend the night with her after the police left, as she was too frightened to be in her house alone. I was more than happy to oblige, and we made ourselves comfortable on the couch downstairs. Ella's bed was located in the room next to where the man had broken in, so she felt safer being in a different part of the house. She also brought out the shotgun that her father had given her. I tried to reassure her that the man was gone, but she was insistent on having it nearby. To be honest, I was grateful that she did. It definitely added an extra layer of security and peace of mind, knowing that we had a means of protection if needed. Ella and I talked for a while, trying to distract ourselves from the scary events that had just transpired. She told me about her childhood, and how her father had taught her how to use the shotgun. I could tell she was still a bit shaken, but she was trying to stay strong 
and not let the fear get the better of her. As the night went on, I could see the tension in her body start to ease. She even dozed off for a bit, and I watched over her, making sure she was okay. Later that night, I was still wide awake, channel surfing on the couch. Ella had managed to doze off beside me. Suddenly, I heard the sound of the kitchen doorknob turning, jolting me out of my daze. I wasn't scared, but I was definitely pissed. I quickly grabbed the gun we kept by the door and flipped on the kitchen light. As soon as I aimed the gun at the door, I saw the figure of the man who had broken into our home before. He looked completely taken aback, and I was grateful that we had remembered to lock the door this time. He stood frozen for a moment before quickly turning and running back into the woods. I woke Ella up and told her what had happened and called the police yet again. When they arrived, they did a sweep of the woods and found no one yet again. They told Ella and I that it'd probably be a good idea to stay somewhere else for the night. Me and Ella said our goodbyes. She was going to stay at her friend's house and I was going home. I left a little after Ella did. I was on the phone with my brother telling him about what had happened. My headlights were on. As I was walking, something caught my eye. That same man was standing at the corner of the house, just watching me. I gunned it out of there and didn't even bother calling the police again. But I did text Ella and she said she was going to call them again. I don't think Ella ever even went back to that house alone. We never found out who he was or what he wanted, but it was a chilling reminder that you can never be too careful. <laughs> I once met up with an old friend of mine, Justin, a friend I had known for a few years prior to the meetup in November 2017. I had actually met this person on a dating site. However, as time went on, the relationship between us became strictly platonic. There were no red flags. My gut did not warn me, so I completely trusted this person. We met up in town, behind a bus station, on a grassy hill surrounded by trees and a tall wall. Our meeting was just to have a smoke, get a little high, and to have a small catch-up. The meetup was fine. I actually started smoking weed a few months before, so I was still relatively new to it. He had brought something new for me to try, purple haze. I wasn't at all anxious about trying it, as I completely trusted this person and would never believe that he would lie to me. He had packed a full blunt for me, but I only managed to smoke a quarter of the blunt. We spoke during this time about work, our previous relationships, and random stuff. About half an hour later, I started to feel extremely lightheaded and anxious. I suddenly had this strange feeling where I did not feel comfortable at all, and I really wanted to go home. When I asked him if I could go home, he offered to take me home, but I said no. It's okay. He offered again. Please, let me take you home. You'll be safe with me. I wouldn't hurt you. I shook my head and said, No thank you. I can take myself home. When I started to walk away, I felt like I was walking on a cloud. My head became dizzy and my eyesight was a little blurry. I had never felt like this before and in time, I started to panic. When we made our way down the hill towards the bus station, I was relieved as there were a lot of people around, so if anything happened, someone would step in. I became extremely terrified of him. I had this horrible feeling in my gut that told me to get away from him. And when I got to the bus station, I told him I would call my taxi here and go home. His tone was no longer nice, but very stern. I'm gonna take you home now and he began to pull out my jacket. I told him no, and that I was going home on my own. He pulled my jacket harder, and I fell against him. He pulled me into him and told me I didn't need to be scared of him. But I was so, so terrified. At this point, I started to feel very paranoid, and I couldn't see properly. I pushed him away from me and rubbed my eyes and called for a taxi. He tried to pull my phone from me, and yelled in my face, do you ever listen? I'm taking you home. I noticed a few people had stopped and asked if I was okay. All I remember was that I wanted to go home. So 
a lady kindly called a taxi for me and waited with me, made sure I was okay, and helped me into the taxi. During the time when I waited for the taxi, he kept trying to get me to come to his car with him, but the lady that looked after me told him to go home and that she was going to take me home instead. So, he left. When I got home, I gave the taxi driver money and told him to keep the change. I didn't want to wait around. I just wanted to get into my bed because at that time, it was the only place I would feel and be safe from harm. That evening, I laid in my bed for five hours straight staring at the ceiling. I don't remember if I thought about anything or if my mom came in at any time. I just remember lying in bed, doing nothing until the paranoia and the sickly feeling began to wear off. I remember looking at my phone and seeing I had 32 missed calls from him, 10 voicemails left and 50 plus messages. The messages were weird. He had sent around 20 messages just asking where I was and when I got home. And in one of those voicemails, he had told me how he had this fantasy of taking me home whilst drugged up and tying me up. He wanted to blindfold me and he wanted me to submit myself to him. I freaked out and blocked him on all social media, Instagram, Snapchat, Discord, and I blocked his number. Before the blocking, I told him if he ever contacted me again, then I would call the police. I heard nothing from him for a month, until I received a text from an unknown number asking me how I was. I haven't given my number to anyone, so I ignored it. I then received another message a few minutes later saying they missed me and that they would see me soon. Thankfully, he doesn't know where I live, which makes me feel a hell of a lot safer. He knew where I worked, but my work has been transferred to another building, so he now has no idea about anything. I feel very fortunate that I found that woman at that bus station who looked out for me.